Alrighty, all the pressure is on you guys today. <laughs> I thought I'd try something different with the lighting. <clears throat> so I killed the metal halides, I'm just running the XHOs, and I put some backlight behind it. Because, believe it or not, we needed something back there besides just some blue glow. So, let's see what happens here. There's someone. Hey, Tyler, how are you? I want to make sure we have audio today. Today's topic, thank you. Uh, today's topic is going to be all about whatever you guys want to talk about. I, um, I couldn't come up with a topic for today. I, I thought about it and I don't know. I think I have a fever. <laughs> so, brain isn't working as good as I'd like it to be. Hey, Bay Area Reefs. I, um, yeah, usually I like to start these off with a specific topic for you guys, but uh, this time I couldn't. And you know what? This one probably won't be a long stream either. I just have a feeling that we're going to kind of get some questions answered, and I'm just going to run away. But uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, I missed you guys. Last week I was in Iowa. Uh, before that, I was in Tucson, and that all happened in the same week, and there was a lot of flights and a lot of issues with the airlines, and somehow I got through all of my trips successfully, so I was really happy about that, but it was frustrating at the same time, because you just want to get there and do what you got to do, and being told you're on the wrong plane, being told we got to wait two more hours before we can take off, things like that, ugh, super annoying. <laughs> so, um... While I was in Iowa, I went to speak at the, the FragFest, and it was really nice. Uh, probably a couple of hundred people showed up that day. Uh, I gave a couple of talks that day. I gave one talk about pests in the aquarium, and then I gave a talk about aquascaping. And once I was done with those two, then I got to walk around and just look at all the beautiful corals. And I even posted a picture on Instagram of one that I really liked. I was like, man, that thing's pretty. But again, I had no plans to take corals home, and I wasn't going home until Sunday afternoon. And this was Saturday, and I was in a hotel. And I thought, how am I going to keep this coral alive for 24 hours before I even fly? And so I just decided I, I probably should hold off. And fortunately, the guy sold it, so I didn't have to worry about it. But uh, yeah, man, I really wanted that coral. <laughs> so, all right, let's start grabbing some of your topics. Um... Eric says, I had a parasite kill off all the fish in my display tank. How long should I wait before adding fish? Do you know what parasite it was that caused this? And I would say you're probably going to run about 8 weeks, 12 weeks fallow, which means fishless, and then introduce a new fish. Um, hopefully after 12 weeks you won't have whatever was in the tank before affect your new fish. And I guess I'm going to recommend that you quarantine your new fish so that way they don't have a uh, they don't bring in a new disease that affects more fish as you buy them. Let's see, next question. Best way to clean a skimmer? Um, I love taking a protein skimmer and putting it outside in a container with vinegar and water and let it run. So just plug it in, let it run overnight. And after uh, that time period has elapsed, then you can just take it apart and you start cleaning it. You can bring the parts inside and clean it at the sink. And you have a nice clean skimmer, nice clean pump. You can make sure the venturi isn't clogged. You know, you can really scrub it down from the inside out. And that's what I recommend. Um, I think that is, it's a pretty simple method of doing it. I know a lot of times we just want to clean the cup and the neck. Um, occasionally we want to clean the pump. But to clean the entire thing, the best way is just run it in vinegar water. Um... Tyler asks, are you going to the Carolina Reef Experience on November 2nd? No, I will be in New York, I believe, that date, so I won't be able to. Um, but thank you for letting me know. Can you go over filtration, Bay Area Reefs asks. Filtration, all right. When it comes to filtration for a reef tank, the basics that I always want is a protein skimmer and a refugium. And I realize that there are lots of ways of accomplishing this. This is just what I recommend. I'm not a fan of filter socks and filter floss and the different ways of trapping organics. I tend to feel like the protein skimmer will remove what it can. And uh, anything that's blowing around in my tank, something can eat it. That's kind of how I look at it. Uh, it is good from time to time to go through your refugium and clean it up. If there's a lot of detr detritus and decay in there. Uh, the same goes with the sump. You can vacuum out the waste. There's a little vacuum attachment that I sell on my website that fits onto a maxi jet. And you can just you know, just vacuum out your sump and make it nice and clean. Um, 
But I just, I really rely on protein skimmers. And uh, let me tell you something. Uh, this was an interesting thing that came up in conversation on Facebook where uh, one person was running the mind stream and turned off their protein skimmer to see if the oxygen level in the tank would drop because we've always heard that protein skimmer adds oxygen. And the number didn't change. <laughs> and this skimmer had been off at least 24 hours, maybe it was two days. But what happened was the CO2 raised in the tank even higher. And that was interesting to me. I mean, I, so I really started reading, and these people that are way smarter than I am were going into it and explaining the, the science. And basically, a protein skimmer, while it's not adding air to your tank, it is off-gassing the CO2. So by running your tank without a skimmer, you're actually not having a way to drive off CO2. And CO2 uh, depresses the pH in the aquarium and makes the pH lower. So if you're trying to have a higher pH, you definitely want to run your protein skimmer. And so um, I would, that's why I really rely on protein skimmers. I feel like they are the safety net of a reef tank. They catch everything. Um, if something weird happens, your skimmer goes crazy, it makes you pay attention to what's happening with your tank too. So it's kind of a, not a barometer, but you know, it is an indicator there's something going on. But it can pull out all kinds of uh, oils and dissolved organic compounds, and it can pull out algae, it can pull out phytoplankton, I mean, it can pull out a lot of things. But we're only pulling out a little tiny bit. You know, there's just, you know, whatever it takes. I mean, I'm running this 450 gallon system, and in all of that time uh, that the skimmer is running, I'm not, sorry, my brain is really hot right now. <laughs> I can feel this, God. I don't know if it's a fever or not. Um, where was I going with that? <clears throat> I lost it. If I get it back, I will continue that thought. But uh, that is my main primary recommendation is a refugium. Now, a lot of people want to abort, uh, they don't want a refugium these days. They want a turf scrubber. And that is another method which apparently is helping with nit nitrate control. And it's growing the microalgae inside a contained area where you can scrape it off every week and throw it away to keep the algae out of your display tank. So uh, that is another method, another approach. I kind of like the refugium um, because I, not only do I have plants growing, I'm adding oxygen to the water from the photosynthesis of the plants, I'm also growing pods. So I like all those things. Um, okay, this scrolled way down. I took way too long in that question. <laughs> Uh, Bay Area Reefs, if you want to see my sump, all you have to do is watch my sump video that I, I did about four months ago. I show the entire thing. We showed the old one coming out and the new one going in. That's definitely a good watch. And if you don't want to see the old, jump ahead like 30 minutes and you just get to that part. Chris, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. And Mohammed says, hello from Kuwait. Wow, wow, I appreciate that. Hope you're staying safe. Let's see. Um, Coral Lovers asks, I'd like to hatch brine shrimp. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what you're saying. Uh, what's the best way? Uh, is there, why everyone says to use regular salt? Uh, actually, I don't know why people would say to use regular salt. I have hatched brine shrimp before. I have an article on my website. You can just go there, type in brine shrimp in the search box, and it'll give you my two articles that show exactly how to set up the hatchery and how to hatch the brine shrimp and uh, to how to feed those to your tank. So be sure you check out that article. Um, Cindy says, I bought cage buffer in powder form. How can I get to mix it well with RO water? The powder stays undissolved in the bottom of the container. Um, yeah, but I bet if you were to test that water, your alkalinity would be up in that container too. So while you might not get the full dissolved, uh, just crystal clear liquid, uh, odds are the fluid itself would still be good to use. Uh, you do want to make sure that whenever you pour something in your tank, you're not pouring in the sludge. So like if you were pouring it out of a container and there was foam, uh, foam, if there was uh, sediment at the bottom, just the white cakey stuff, I would pour, you know, the majority of it and, say, and not pouring the last of it possibly. Depends on the size of your aquarium, what they can handle. If it's a small tank, obviously you're going to be more careful. Uh, if you don't want to use KH buffer, you could use baked, <laughs> baked baking soda. And I have an article about that on my website and it shows exactly how to use a 99 cent box of Arm & Hammer baking soda to make your own alkalinity solution for, well, a dollar. <laughs> so I would recommend reading that. Uh, Eric says that he believes what caught his tank was velvet. I'm not a fish disease guy. I keep saying that. You guys never believe me. I don't know the answers to the fish diseases. Um, there's a fish disease forum on Reef to Reef. You could definitely go there. 
There's a person there by Humblefish that seems to know everything. Uh, I have a book. I tried reading it to learn, and I just didn't retain it. So I'm going to have to read it again. Then maybe I can start answering questions. But I still kind of feel like 12 weeks is probably a good estimate of uh, not having fish in your tank after something had wiped it out like velvet. <clears throat> Um, yes, Eric says, do you have any opinion on using ChemiClean to get rid of red slime? I highly recommend it. Do it. Just do it. And on my website, if you go to about, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep pointing you guys to my website. I'm sorry. I just, it's easier. Uh, you go to my website and you click on about or about me and there will be FAQs and just go through the list of FAQs and I tell you exactly how to use ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX. They both do a great job of removing the cyano and your tank will be pretty in about three to five days. Um, I think this is a budget question. How do you not go nuts? I just spent $2,000 this week. <laughs> well, what did you buy, though? Maybe you bought a lot of cool stuff. We want to know. Uh, yeah, you, you have to kind of decide what you can afford. And I, even when I'm shopping for corals, I usually am just like, how much is it? And then I decide if I want to buy it. But there are times where I have had on the orange glasses, and I just kept handing my credit card over, and I just paid it later. <laughs> So it happens to all of us. We all get excited about certain things. I would just recommend that, uh, you know, it's not so much the budget, it's what you can afford. I mean, one person might not be able to spend $200 this week and you had $2,000 to spend. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just, we're all in different places right now. Uh, this time I don't know, Alex. Uh, the opinion on an orange spotted file fish in a 22 gallon. I don't know. Um, seems plausible, um, but I don't know if that fish needs a bigger tank or not. I've never kept that. Oh, um, back to the skimmer cleaning. Yeah, I did say vinegar and water. Yeah, it's like 50-50, or, or it could be 25% vinegar, 75% water. You're just trying to break things down. <clears throat> Another th product that people like using is citric acid. Apparently, you can buy a big bag of it off Amazon, you know, like five pounds of the powder, and you can mix up some with some water and use that to dissolve things away, and it's completely safe. So you don't have to worry about dealing with acid, you know, like something that's going to burn your concrete when you're done. At least, that's what I think. <laughs> I might need to double-check that fact. Uh, I'm not 100% positive on that. But, yeah, I've heard several people say they're using citric acid these days. Uh, Mike, I couldn't buy that coral and have him keep it because he was four hours away and he was leaving that night. Uh, I was thinking maybe I could bring it to a fish store, but you just never know how things are going to work out. And then I thought, well, maybe I could keep it with another hobbyist and I could get it from them the next day on the way to the airport. And then, you know, what happened is toward the end of the day, I walked by that booth and the coral was sold and that solved the whole problem entirely. I didn't have to spend any money at all and I didn't have to worry about keeping it alive or risking killing it. So, you know, it, it all worked out. It's fine. Maybe... There's a chance that another coral seller I know bought it. <laughs> because when I posted the picture, he says, I've got you covered, Mark. And so I'm thinking, maybe he bought it, and in six months I'll get a frag from what he bought. You know, So eventually I'll find that coral. I mean, it's not like it was the only one on the planet. It's just, it caught my eye. It was awesome. And the funniest part was this vendor had a lot of stuff. But he had these couple of SPS pieces, and they were big. Like about that long. I mean, it was a big chunky piece of coral with all these tips about to burst off of it like excitement and he says yeah i just want to get all these sps out of my tank and i was just laughing i was like that's what you want to get rid of that's your issue and he was like ah i don't want sps i'm like okay all right all right fair enough we all like different things um luke i'm gonna point you to my website front page of the site new to the hobby click that and start reading 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 and the more you read, the more successful you'll be before you spend even a dollar. And listen, I had a guy call me up a week ago. And he said, hey, I heard you build reef tanks. And I said, no, I don't. And then he said, well, you used to? I'm like, no, I never built reef tanks. I build the equipment that goes underneath the reef tank. I have a couple of reefs that are on my website and on YouTube. And he said, well, all right, is it hard to keep one? <laughs> And I was like, if you set it up properly, it, it's not that hard to keep. And then he said, well, what do I need to know? And I was like, oh, well, there's no way I can answer this over the phone. There's just, you cannot possibly learn everything I can tell you, even on a 30-minute phone call with you taking notes. Just like you couldn't do it with this live stream. 
I just can't inundate you with enough information in 30 minutes, and that would be a very long phone call, right? So I just told him, go to my website and click on New to the Hobby, and or New to Saltwater, and click on that. It's right there at the top of the page. And that way, it'll give you a lot of great information that will help you really know, you know about the equipment, about the livestock, about uh, water quality, about temperature considerations, uh, placement in your home. I mean, there's a lot of things to take into play. And, you know, we want you to be successful, but basically we want you to learn as much as you possibly can. So, Luke, what I'm saying is learn a bunch before you spend any money. I understand sometimes things fall in your lap and you're just stuck with it. That's fine, too, but always keep learning. That's what I do. I keep reading magazines like Coral Magazine. I'm reading posts online. I'm always taking in new information, trying out new ideas, seeing new equipment, trying to keep up with what's going on. So I recommend that to you. All righty. Um, JCS says, how big can Spock get before you may have to remove him? He's a, he's a she. Um, and could that fish get bigger? Yeah, actually it could. Um, Spock has been with me since 2004, so that's 15 years. And I believe if she was in the ocean, she could be double the size. I think that what she is, is she's, she's kind of matched herself to the size of the tank she's in. And that's something I've heard in the past, you know, the bigger the tank, the bigger the fish can become. So if I had, you know, like a 5,000 gallon reef, she might be larger. Yeah. So she'd have more swimming room, that's for sure. But uh, hopefully I won't have to move her. I mean, she's my, she's my friend. She's been with me a long time. Um, I don't know the answer to that, Scott. Let me see here. Oh, okay, this is true. Preston says that uh, vinegar discolored some of the colored PVC on a protein skimmer, and that does happen. I had a protein skimmer sitting in vinegar that had a red riser pipe, and the pipe turned pink. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess if you had colored PVC, you might want to test for reactivity against the products you're using to clean with and see if it affects it, or just accept that it's not going to look like the day you bought it. I mean, that, that is a thing. It's true. Um, Carlos says, speaking of skimmers, I was looking at the Aero Aqua Duo. I just saw the, the, uh, the ad for it. Very interesting looking skimmer. I, I really want to hear it. I mean, it's my number one thing is, what's it sound like? That's what I always care about most. But I kind of like the idea that it has a pump in there with two turbines. Uh, that was actually a pump that released about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, where you could have one pump in your sump, but it would intake from two sides and have two outlets going up <clears throat> instead of just having one. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a neat idea. I guess it makes sense. You think the motor in the middle, it can have an impeller on either side. But uh, now someone has decided to put that in the body of a protein skimmer, which is kind of cool. So it, I think it'd be a great space saver because you don't have a protein skimmer with pumps sticking off the side like we used to in the old days. And uh, yeah, that thing might be really cool. I, I heard there's a review about, or a review, there's an overview of it on Reef Builders. So you could check that out for some facts. Of course, you can go to Coral View and check their website to read the latest details. I even found a couple of mistakes in their ad when they sent it to me, and I let them know so they could correct their website. So, <clears throat> but I didn't, I haven't had hands on, so I can't really give an opinion one way or another about how, how well it'll work or what it sounds like. But for me, a protein skimmer always needs to be very quiet. Uh, do you think oversizing your skimmer is a good idea? Uh, actually, I try to keep the protein skimmer size relatively close to the size of the tank. Now, the one I have on my tank, they rated it for 1,000 gallons. I didn't say I need one for 1,000 gallons. Uh, the NIO skimmer was rated for that, and I thought that was very ambitious for that skimmer because that skimmer was actually slightly smaller than my Euro Reef that I had for, again, oh, like 12 years straight or something like that. 14 years? It was another long... I had it from since 2004. And uh, so that protein skimmer I ran for a very long time. I never would have considered that to be a good enough skimmer for 1,000 gallons. But I guess if it was a light load, you could do it. I really don't know how they came up with that one. <clears throat> and uh, that is always going to be the challenge with any protein skimmer you buy in the market. They're going to rate it for a certain size. And you have to, uh, sometimes you just have to learn through experience what it can, can and cannot do. And there will be times where you're going to buy something and it's just not going to work out. And you're just going to have to buy again. But hopefully with enough research 
and a lot of feedback from other people. You can kind of zone in on the right purchase in the first place and get a good one that makes you happy and you can stick with for many years. Because I had the Euro Reef for 12 years and all I did was clean it and change the pumps on it. And I kept you know, making sure it was a good shape. And then when NIOS said, we want you to try out our skimmer, I was like, I don't know. And they said, no, we're gonna give you this skimmer to try out and I ended up loving it and I bought a second one for my other tank. So I really was impressed. I still have the Euro Reef in my back room and I haven't used it since that video was made. So what is that, four, three, four years ago? It's just taking up space. Um... Hey, Zach, thank you very much for the compliment on the overflow cover. I was just visiting a, a hobbyist in Iowa, and he had a couple of my covers on his overflow boxes to keep the algae from growing in there. And I ship those out all over the place. Um, is there such a thing as an automatic water change unit? Something other than an irrigation timer and an overflow bulkhead? Yeah, actually there are. There's quite a few products on the market. Auto Aqua came out with something a couple years ago. Uh, a lot of people are using the Apex's dose to do automatic water changes where they suck in water as they pump, uh, they suck out water as they're pumping in new water with two dosing heads. Um, there are more and more devices coming to market that are specifically geared for the hobbyist to do automatic water changes. Uh, I was just reading, one of my friends has a reef bowl. It's a bowl that's a reef. It's a small, I don't know, six gallons. It's, a, it's like a vase. And she's using a forehead doser from Camor, and she's using a couple of the heads on that to uh, do the water change automatically once a week. And she was also dosing in a couple things with the other two heads to maintain what the tank needs. So yeah, there's lots of products on the market. You don't have to use like a sprinkler timer. Uh, Tyler asked a good question. I have a little mold in my canopy. Is this a problem? I'm planning on painting over it and coating it over with polyurethane. Actually, if you're getting mold in your canopy, there's too much moisture inside and it's not venting properly. So I would look at the canopy and see what you can do to get some fresh air in there. If you can put a fan on the top or on the end, you can blow fresh air in from the room and that will help avoid the condensation and the mold. You can definitely clean the mold off the canopy. You don't, you don't want to spread. You don't want to get worse. I've seen it in the past. I didn't sweat it. If you, uh, if you clean the wood really well, then you could apply something like Kills, K-I-L-Z. It's a white paint, and uh, that is an inhibitor of that kind of thing from growing again. Um, it's a, lot, a lot of painters use it as an undercoat um, before they hit it with the final color they want. But, uh, you know, urethane is just going to seal the wood itself, but mold can grow on the surface of anything. So it, I think it's really you're having moisture issues in there that you're going to want to uh, remove through some fresh air. Okay, um, Mohammed says, I'm having a lot of trouble with zoanthids. They seem to be doing fine in my other tank, but once I put them in my 400 gallon, it seems just like they would just melt away. There's no pests, the other corals are doing great. Uh, you didn't say what kind of corals the other corals were, but the thing is, is that your one tank might have ideal conditions, ideal flow, the right amount of light, the nutrients are just right, and your 400 gallon is not the same. Um, unless these two tanks are tied together. If they're tied together and they're all sharing the same water, then it's going to be something's going on in the 400 gallon. It could be some fish is nipping at them. It could be shrimp are picking at them. It could be hermit crabs are irritating them. It could be asterina starfish crawling over them. I mean, there's a lot of things that go on in our tanks. Uh, a lot of times we don't see every little nuance of what's happening. But if they're happy in the one tank, you have two choices. You can keep them in that one tank and uh, focus on other things that do well in your big tank, or you can you know, just really stay on this topic until you figure out what is going on. But it could be that your 400 gallons water is a little too pristine for those zoanthids that are not doing well. My tank has zoanthids right here, and these are zoanthids, and these are pallies, and these are zoanthids, and over here are some. And there's a few tucked away in that rock work back there too. But I don't have like millions, and I, I essentially ignore them. They're just in the tank, they're kind of pretty, um, but I'm not trying to actively feed them, you know, specifically. And I'm not doing anything that would uh, that would promote growth. I'm just maintaining the reef tank, and they just kind of do their thing naturally. And I've watched some just go away, and I've watched others that are that really stay with me for years and years and years. So that's a 
That's just how it is. <laughs> you're, when you get a tank and you set up with a whole bunch of different corals, in the end, you're only going to have certain species that are going to dominate and, and they're going to do really well. You're not going to have 100 species. It's just not how it works. Let's see. Ma asks the question, do you think that aqua illumination is the best illumination for a marine tank? AI makes a lot of nice lights, and there are other brands. I use Radions, and I use Metal Halides. I use XHOs from Reef Bright. There's a lot of brands on the market. There are some brands that are inexpensive. They came over from China that you can use as well. So I really can't say who's got the best. Um, you know, I, 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 liked, I like what I use. <laughs> So I might be slightly biased because I made the purchase and I use it. So now I defend it because I spent my money on it, you know, that kind of a thing. But no, I'm really happy. You know, the Radeon, uh, I put that one over the tank, over the Anemone Cube a couple of years ago on a live stream. And it's uh, just, I don't have to think about it. It just does this thing every single day. It turns on, turns off, turns on, turns off. It's just automatic. I don't have to think about it. And I prefer that. I don't like tinkering. I don't like opening the app and making adjustments. You know, just, just do your job. That's all I care about. <laughs> So I would say, you know, um, that's the best light in the world. <laughs> Did that make sense? I mean, you know, it's hard to say this is the one. Oh, Eric asked a good question. How do I keep ammonia in check in the quarantine tank? Well, you got to stay on top of water changes. Uh, you can add a dechlorinator to the water to remove ammonia, to lock it up. Um, but... There's a an ammonia alert badge you can put on the inside of the aquarium. They're really inexpensive, and they change color based on the ammonia level. And if it gets too high, you know you have to do an even bigger water change. But if you're doing daily water changes on your quarantine tank, like 10%, you should be able to stay ahead of a, a, an ammonia problem. But you definitely don't want it to get out of control. So I would say you're going to use something like uh, Ammo Plus or uh, Prime. These are a couple of products that come to mind that will help lock up ammonia and keep it from getting out of control. And then when you do your water change, you're removing that stuff and you're putting in new clean water without ammonia. And uh, yeah, but it depends how, how big the fish load is in your quarantine. If you've got, you know, like a 20 gallon tank and there's like 30 fish in there, it's going to be a really hard battle to stay ahead of that because you've got so many fish peeing in the water. Also, after you feed five minutes later, suck out any food that wasn't consumed because it's just going to rot and add to the ammonia problem. Mm. Paul's Tanks is here from Maui, Hawaii. Hi there. Howard asked the question, how about uh, how much it is, how about how to raise amphipods? Ah, I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a guy in Club Mila's Reef that is growing all kinds of pods and algae and uh, liquid foods, which kind of remind me of the rotifer family and phytoplankton and stuff like that. And I swear that guy was making a million amphipods. But yeah, they are expensive to buy. And so typically we buy small bottles of pods or bags of pods from Algae Barn or Pod My Reef, you know, these different companies that serve them, Reef Nutrition. And you pour them in your tank after lights out while the fish are asleep and get them into the rock work so they can breed in there. And then if your tank isn't nutrient poor, if there's plenty of things for those little pods to eat, they should proliferate within the system and you'll have more. But I've never outright tried myself to raise amphipods. So I, <clears throat> I can't really go into that much further than that. But I would just recommend adding things late at night. Oh, thanks, Andrea, for adding that link. Scott says, what's your opinion on ozone? Have you run one before, and what did you run it at? Uh, have you covered this before? No, um, I've never run ozone. I've never felt the need. Uh, I know it can give you better water clarity. And it's very important that you filter out the ozone so that you don't inhale it yourself as a homeowner. So you want to make sure you're not making anyone sick in your home. One of the reasons I've never chosen to run ozone is because just watching the news, they'll say, hey, the weather's really bad outside. The ozone is up. You know, stay inside today. I'm like, oh, ozone alert day. I, it wouldn't be healthy for me to go mow my lawn today. I'm going to avoid that. So, I mean, if they're telling me 
to avoid excess ozone that's in our air, then I don't want to pump ozone into my house. So that is kind of my <clears throat> cautious approach to ozone. But if you want to run it, <clears throat> it needs to run into a protein skimmer that can handle it. The skimmer has to be built for ozone. If it's built wrong, it'll just craze the acrylic. So you want to make sure that it's ozone ready. Uh, and then you're going to have to run some kind of carbon too on the output of the protein skimmer. And then you should have a sensor that also measures ozone levels to kind of stay ahead of any kind of disasters. So anyway, if you want to follow all that <laughs> and it still sounds good to you, you can do it. But, uh, you know, do your homework, do your research, uh, read up on it as best you can. I, I don't have anything more in depth on that topic. Vitz says, I'd like to know what you have to dose to have a l as little water changes as you do. And do carbon reactors clean all the biowarfare toxins? Okay, two-part question. So first of all, the tank itself is a mature tank. This reef is turning six years old next in, uh, I'm sorry, not next month. Uh, yeah, next month, October, uh, uh, November 10th, it's going to turn six years old. And this tank uh, this year has had two water changes. So um, I dose the alkaline and calcium and magnesium. They all three come out of my calcium reactor media, so that's automatic. In addition, I do have magnesium that I mix up. I just made a gallon the other day that I'm going to hook up to a dosing pump, and that is added to the tank to make sure there's enough magnesium in there for the system. I dose Prodibio every 15 days, and uh, I'm putting in Bioptim, BioDigest, Stronti Plus, ID Plus, and uh, I feed Benarif every... Well, I try to remember to do it twice a week. Sometimes I forget. I feed frozen food every single night. Um, I top off with RODI water. And uh, I clean the glass. And I, I keep my hand out of the tank. <laughs> I mean, I finally got my walkboard back, and I still haven't been up on it, partially because of my back problems. But uh, I just have not been reaching the tank. I stay out of it. Just let it grow. I, if you'll, I don't know if you can notice this right there. That spot right there is a, <laughs> it's weird, I'm pointing like a totally different direction. Uh, that spot back there is all shiny acrylic. I scraped a quarter of that panel yesterday to get rid of all the coralline because I hate it. I just, I feel like the coralline is actually obscuring the corals. There is a little green coral right there. And that would look way better if it had a black backdrop instead of a purple wall. So I'm trying to chisel away all the coralline. So I worked on the spot last night for 10 minutes or so. And uh, I need to address the rest of that side and just get it nice and clean. But uh, like I said, for the most part, I keep my hands out of the tank. And uh, then you asked about biowarfare. So corals have, uh, they're releasing all kinds of chemicals in the water all the time. And it is a kind of chemical warfare. You're right. And so by running fresh uh, granulated activated carbon inside a reactor, the water has to flow through the carbon to come back out. And that can remove a lot of toxins from the water. But it's not something that you can just expect to work for a month straight. I personally believe that carbon is only good for about three or four days, and after that, it has lost its absorption, and I feel like it's doing nothing at that point. And I know there's going to be people that won't agree with me, but that's okay. Uh, the fact is, is that if you look at your tank, and you look at it from the end of the tank, you know, looking the full length, and you're staring at it, when you run carbon, it's crystal clear. And then after a few days, it's not crystal clear anymore. And that is my point, is that you want to make sure that, or I mean, that I can see it's already losing its ability to clarify the water. So that is my one hint that my carbon is already running out. I just know. So <clears throat> I have two articles on my website written by a really smart guy uh, about carbon that you can read. They're really in-depth. They're super in-depth. <laughs> But I felt like they were so important that I asked the author, could I please put those articles on my website so others could read it too? And he gave me permission. So I, I feel if you want to know more about carbon, read that. But this, for me, carbon's good for a few days. Then I just remind, or I recommend you remove the reactor, clean it out, dry it out, let it sit. And then next month, do it again for three or four days. And just polish your tank once a month for a few days. And that should be okay with most coral... Uh, chemical warfare, if you are dealing with like a huge leather coral, like when I had a 280 gallon tank, I'd say a quarter of that tank was a leather. It was just a ginormous leather coral. And I ran carbon on that tank 
probably every two weeks, maybe even more frequently because the core was so big and I knew it would affect the rest of my reef. And so I was constantly, I was buying carbon 55 pounds at a time. So I'd have plenty of carbon on hand. And uh, in that case, I used more. You always rinse it really well. Make sure there's no dust going into your system. But uh, no, I don't uh, run it long term. I don't feel like it's going to work magic for a month or something like that or two months or three months it wears out and then you just have to remove it and set up a new batch but i wouldn't tell you do it every three days that's crazy okay that was a really long answer uh, tony says i have a question would you recommend an led light diffuser i've noticed a drop of 50 par with a diffuser on any advantage of LED diffuser besides getting rid of the disco light effect? Well, that's pretty much it. That's the reason why they do it, is to get rid of the disco light. And uh, kind of even the, out, the lighting a little bit, sort of like a T5 bulb would do. So, yeah, you'll lose some par. I mean, it makes sense. You can always turn up the light to a higher setting to get the par back that you lost. Or you could just see how the tank does with a little less par. You know, maybe it won't even be affected by that slight dip and just continue to be happy. You'll just have to actually, I mean, this is one of the things where you're gonna have to watch the corals for a few weeks, a month, and see how it did to decide should you tamper with it again? <laughs> should you tinker or should you leave it alone? But uh, yeah, there's people out there using diffusers. Uh, there was a fitting that Kessel came out with for their new A360X that you can put on the bottom to narrow the beam down and I thought that was pretty interesting, and it wasn't a diffuser, but it was, again, one of those things that changes the way the light spreads into the tank. So there's always things we're doing and improving with our LED technology, trying to find just that right look that makes your tank look perfect. All right, let's see. Riley says, what's the favorite fish in the hobby? Well, I'd say for most people, it's a clownfish. Uh, for me? <laughs> I still love the Mandarin. I think the Mandarin Gobi is gorgeous, and uh, that's a, a highlight. Flame Angel is another great, uh, great fish that I enjoy seeing. I haven't had one in a while. And uh, the Peppermint Angel fish would be awesome if I had $25,000 to spend, but I do not. So, yeah. But, you know, even when it was back when I was in love with clownfish, you know, I was like, that's my favorite fish. It was the true Percula, which is not the fish most people have. Most people have Ocellaris, which is, used to be called the false Percula. <laughs> and I like the true Percula. They had an orange body, they had a thick white stripe, and they had a black border around it. And I just, I thought that was a great fish. And I had a couple of true Perculas when I first got into this hobby. Super Yellow Tanks says, what's your opinion on natural seawater? Uh, if you can get it and you can filter it, and it measures well, then use it if it saves you money. Uh, it's a nice option to have. A lot of us do not have that option, and we have to make our own with ASW, which is artificial seawater. Does phosphate cause algae on the glass and in the tank? Absolutely. Phosphate definitely fuels algae growth. Uh, I was just uh, looking at one guy's tank last weekend. He was describing it in the car, telling me how horrible it was. <laughs> that I mean, he was so frustrated with his reef tank that he said, I'm just going to drain it and fill it up with freshwater fish. So I was expecting the worst. And when I walked in, it wasn't bad at all. I was just like, okay, I expected way worse. He goes, oh, but look. And he was trying to point out the little nuances that really bothered him. And I just said, you know what? I think Live Rock and Hands could fix this. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it sounds like a sales pitch, but I was like, you know, I'm basically recommending to him like to spend 40 bucks on his tank and make his tank look better. And uh, I'm not saying you have to buy it, this or you have to do that or get rid of this, you know. I did suggest he was having real problems with his frag system and the corals in the frag system are doing very poorly. I said, well, how do the corals do in your main tank? And he says, well, they're doing great there. I said, then take everything out of the frag tank and put them in the main tank where they're happy and just turn off the lights of the frag tank, let everything in there, you know, the algaes and stuff just die off, clean it all out, start it fresh, and see if you can figure out what's going on. I also told him to start doing some very specific measuring um, because he has all his probes in the sump, and then he has pumps moving water to the tank and to the frag system, and I felt like maybe he should measure what's going on in this tank with pH, and then measure this one with pH, and then measure the sump, and see if it's all the same number. In theory, it should be. But if the flow is going slowly to the tank, 
if the tank has less um, ag surface agitation, the pH could be even lower. It could be why he's just losing corals. He already was not running a protein skimmer. He hadn't been running it for a while because he replaced the sump. And that's where the whole CO2 thing uh, conversation came up, where I was talking about how it, oh, you're not driving off the CO2. No wonder your pH is so low in this tank. I mean, when I say low, it was like 7.5. And I was like, wow, that's really low. And he goes, yeah, I'm lucky if I can get up to 7.8. And I was like, okay, you need to turn on your protein skimmer and uh, need to make sure that probe is calibrated, which he says it was. And, um, oh, I suggested maybe dosing caulkwasser at night, just like a gallon at a time to see what it would do to buffer up the pH some. But anyway, he's uh, going to be working on that and give me some feedback, and hopefully I'll have a good story to tell about that later. But for now, it wasn't a, a disaster case like he thought, and it definitely was something that I felt could be salvaged. So uh, don't ever let something like phosphate just slow you down. There's products like phosphate Rx that will just remove it from your tank overnight, and I've been using it for 11 years, and I love that stuff. So you know, the higher the phosphate, the more likely of algae on the glass. Cleaning your glass regularly is important uh, before it can really take hold and become hard. We have to chisel it off with a razor blade or a credit card. But as long as it's a film algae, you can knock it off with your, with your cleaning magnet. So I recommend that. Uh, 508 says, I am wanting to, I'm getting ready to move and I got to move my tanks and how should I go about it? Well, the first thing I would do is wherever you're moving to, if possible, if you have access to it, like before the move, is to have salt water already mixing and ready over there before you even show up. Also, make sure that the spot where the tank is going to go is solid and uh, trustworthy, that there's enough electrical outlets there for that area for all the plugs we have to plug in. And um, then when it comes time to move the tank and you're moving your household items too, Something's got to give. I mean, basically, it's your tank. you got to move your tank that day, so everyone else has to move furniture. And you can't really do tank and furniture at the same time, in my opinion. You know, Maybe you move furniture the day before, you do the tank the next day when there's nothing else to interrupt you, because you're moving livestock. You're moving animals that are living and breathing. And so you're moving one life support system into another life support system, and everything has to be right. Can't be anything in your way. Can't be tripping over crap in the hallway. I mean, it's got to be... Easy access, walk in, do what you got to do, focus on it until it's done, and then when you're finally done, eat some pizza, and then start dealing with unpacking boxes. Uh, that's kind of the very short version of a very long day you're about to have. And having that extra salt water there is very important because as you're working, you might decide the water that you brought with you is so dirty and so mucked up from the rock work, the sand made the water so nasty, you want to have some nice clean water in the new tank. <laughs> Jordan says, this is a PSA, people. you got to be careful with those orange glasses. I'm talking about these things. Uh, don't wear those. <laughs> They'll make you use your credit card. It's terrible. It's awful. And it's a true story. Ah. It's good seeing you, Jay. How do I say it? Jaw Reef? Uh, it was great to see you at Aquashella as well. Go frag yourself. I love that. That was a hilarious shirt. Some of these questions I think were asked twice. I already answered them. Hmm, Brian, this one's a weird one. I mean, Green Star Pulse can close up for a week or two and then finally open up again. Uh, you might take a very soft toothbrush and just kind of brush them clean. Make sure that your, uh, your power head isn't blasting them. Uh, you said it was after you changed your filter that the coral closed down. It could just be coincidence. might not even be related to what you did with the filter. But, you know, definitely look at your entire system and see if there's anything obvious. Maybe some magna has split open in the meantime and is starting to cause damage to the system. But star pops are pretty hardy, should come back around. They might just be a little dirty and need to be cleaned off. That would be something I'd look at. Uh, Steven, the Tammy video is on my hard drive, where, where it's been for too long. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this one is by Troy. What do you suggest to do if you can't figure out why you're suddenly closed up randomly for days, even after you test water parameters and temperature? I feel like there's some words missing. That's how I was reading it so slowly. Um, you're having something closed up, some type of coral closed up, but everything's measuring normal like it normally is. Whenever I have a coral that just acts abnormally from what it always does, that's when I sit way across the room with the lights out, just the tank is lit, and I watch the fish and see if there's any kind of fish making laps and coming back and hitting that, hitting that, hitting that coral. Because that's usually what's happening. When something closes up, something's irritating it. Because if everything is the same and you haven't made any changes, you haven't dosed anything, you haven't dropped anything on top of that coral, then in theory it should reopen. It should be able to get back to its regular happy self unless something is pestering it. And that could be a you know, a coral bedded shrimp is camping out on it. It could be peppermint shrimp are picking at it. It could be a fish is nipping at it. Uh, and not just, just because a fish stops and pecks at a coral does not mean all your corals are in danger. Uh, they are also, you know, fish are looking for bits of algae to eat all the time. And they might find something on an SPS coral and you're thinking that coral has nothing for them to eat, but they're still doing this. But the coral usually can handle a, a few hits here or there. You know, all the fish behind me, they're all doing something or other. I, I can't tell them, don't touch. You know, they just, they're living. That's, they're living creatures. But that would be my guess, is that something is possibly pestering the coral in question that I believe you were asking about. Let's see. I want to jump to some more questions. You guys are very chatty today. Oh, cool. Glenn says he went to the to UK's first reef aquatic ex expedition last Saturday. Uh, it was for the Coral Freaks and had David Saxby, a TMC employer, that I don't know, um, and Jamie Craggs, who's doing the Spawning Corals pro project, which is amazing. Jamie Craggs has a video you can find on the BRS channel now where he explains how we can all spawn corals in our aquariums. And I was actually flipping through my phone the other day, looking at some old pictures, and I came across a coral that used to be in my temporary tank and I was looking at it really closely and I think that I actually took a picture of that coral the night before it was about to spawn. I think all the eggs were under the surface and I, I think I missed that event from happening. But uh, yeah, being able to go to those events, guys, always go. If there's something even remotely close to where you live, get in your car and go. Go get educated. Go, go buy something new. Just have fun with other hobbyists that love the hobby as much as you do. It's totally worth the trip, no matter what. Even if you don't buy a darn thing the whole day, you know, just the experience of being with others and, and seeing their excitement and hearing their conversations can really motivate you to work more on your tank when you get home. Um, no, it's not a myth. I mean, it's, it goes way back. But uh, there also used to be rules, you know, like no more than one inch per gallon of fish in your aquarium. But fish do grow in relation to the size of the tank they're in. Now, that doesn't mean a fish cannot outgrow a tank. It definitely could. It has the ability to do so, and obviously the more you feed, <laughs> you could actually in, uh, accelerate that process. You know, it could just really beef up. But it's not just like a guaranteed, like you put this tang in this tank, it's going to outgrow it for absolutely sure. It just depends on the tank and it depends on the fish and uh, the entire environment that fish is in. But like you've seen Dory in my anemone cube, it's been in there for about three years and it's only about this big in a tank that's 24 inches by 24 inches. And you know, she seems healthy and well and fat. And while at some point I do want to move her, I don't feel a pressing need to move her. There's not like a, oh my God, that poor fish can't even turn around. I mean, technically she has to dodge a lot of tentacles. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, but she's been doing it for years and there's not like marks all over her body where she's constantly getting stung or something that would say, okay, yeah, I gotta save this fish. So yes, we don't wanna put a huge fish in a small tank. I always recommend get tiny fish and enjoy watching them grow in your system. And then at some point you may discover it's time to go larger. If Spock were to just suddenly put on six inches <laughs> and just become so much larger, I would probably just contact the Dallas World Aquarium and see if they'd be interested in taking a tang off my hands and put it in one of their 1500 gallon displays, which where everyone could appreciate it every single day. So that would be nice. But uh, like I said, she's been with me a long time. I don't see her getting like bigger every single year. That's not what I'm seeing. So 
I do kind of feel like the size, the propensity to grow larger is limited by the size of the aquarium, I believe. But there's always going to be some fish that's going to break the rule. But I think that for the most part, most fish stay kind of within their confines. But, you know, it just depends on the species. Frank says that in his 180-gallon tank, he has been using Red Sea Pro Salt and dosing two-part. All the parameters are great except for magnesium that's always measuring at 1,700. Well, I would measure your next batch of salt water and see what its magnesium level is. If it's 1,700 as well, that explains why your number can't come down because you're always adding more with every water change. Uh, also, you could get a second test kit, maybe a different brand, and do a comparison. Or you can ask your fish store to test the magnesium of your water, bring a water sample with you, have them measure it right in front of you, and then you can find out if your 1,700 is true. I mean, it could be true. It's possible. <laughs> we do get crazy numbers in our tank sometimes. But uh, I would double-check the kit and find out if that's an accurate number or not before I did anything else. And you can always check your new salt water to make sure it's mixing up properly, too, to know where it's even coming from in the first place. Um, Michael says, there's an article on Reef to Reef that says vinegar can damage plastic like the Vortec pumps. Well, I've got a couple of Vortex sitting in a pitcher on my counter full of vinegar water, and uh, I've been cleaning them that way for years. I think it just comes down, I mean, okay, there was a guy that was in our club, and he, um, he had, I think it was a Rio pump. I think it was Rio, which they were inexpensive. And you could buy them everywhere. And he put it in a bucket of vinegar water, or just vinegar, something like that, in his garage and forgot about it. <laughs> and it was like a month later, he found it, and the entire pump had just, it was the weirdest looking thing. It had kind of basically exploded outward and had like all these like curled leaves all over it, like the bark of a tree. It was crazy looking. He's like, oh, vinegar can actually destroy a pump if you give it enough time. So maybe it's just how long they're in the vinegar water. I've had Vortec pumps sitting in uh, vinegar water for days until I finally got around to taking them apart and cleaning them. And I've, I've, the only thing that happens is the O-ring on the inside may stretch and get too big, and you have to replace the O-ring. But I haven't seen problems with the magnets or the plastic or the cage or the back. All those things, they, I've not run into that problem. So I'd have to actually read that thread for myself to see why they're saying it's damaging so much plastic, including Vortex. That's weird but maybe it's running it at 100%. Uh, Hammy's Reef says, does anyone know what eats red turf algae and how to get rid of it? I would, first of all, I'd tell you again, knock your phosphates down, because as soon as the phosphates are out of the system, any kind of algae is gonna start to weaken. The next thing you can do is you can take a power head and you can blow off your rock work to kick off all the detritus that's trapped in that algae to starve the algae of the fuel that it's using. All the particulates it's trapping within its turf algae, or that, little, that little fuzzy green stuff, it creates its own little sand bed in there with all the detritus, and it's eating that to be healthy and strong. So by stripping that all out, by blowing it out with a power head, you're stealing the food source, then you remove the phosphate from the water, and then the stuff starts to die off. It becomes weaker. Now, at this point, you should be able to pinch some of it off, but I know turf algae is super tiny and coarse. A cleanup crew is important. A cleanup crew has to be snails and hermit crabs. And I know a lot of people say, I have snails, and it seems like no one has hermit crabs. And hermit crabs are just as important as snails because they actually will clip off the algae like little lawnmowers. And so not only do you have snails devouring it, you have hermit crabs cutting it down, and those guys work in tandem. If you are worried about the hermit crabs killing the snails, it happens. <laughs> it's just, I'd be like, oh, I don't like that. I'm like, I understand. Okay, oh well, it's life. That's how this works. But if you can get red-legged hermits, if you get scarlet hermits, scarlets are much more expensive. They're not snail killers. Uh, the blue legs, are the, the active ones that will just go after a snail. And it happens. But they're not going to get all your snails. You're not going to just have a million blue hermits and no snails. That's not how it works either. You're going to lose a few snails. Sometimes you lose a snail, it falls off the glass, it's face down or face up in the sand bed, and a hermit crab walks up and just eats them because it's an opportunistic you know, chance to get a meal. That's, that's not that the hermit crab was bad or evil or hurt your snail. The snail wasn't doing his job. He fell off the glass. So, you know, things happen in the reef tank. 
but having some hermit crabs in there is very important. If you can get tiny, itty bitty little blue legs, do that. Uh, because first of all, they take forever to get big, and they will do great on algae and get into all those little nooks and crannies, and they'll clean it up, and you won't have to uh, be concerned about them damaging anything because they're too small with tiny little pinchers where they just can't do any damage to things you care about. Hey, Michael Wells is chiming in on that Aero Aqua skimmer that we were talking about before. Cool, glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm sure, I, I, I found it very interesting. I just want to learn more about it. Um, Luke says, uh, what kind of lighting would you recommend for a mixed reef? I'm researching the Kessel 360X or the new AI lights. The 360X might be a great light for your tank. You just, and you can dial in the colors you want. You can control it with an app. It's a pretty nice light. Uh, AI, of course, has an app as well that will let you control, you know, like the, they've had the hydras. I think they just came out with a new light. Someone was just talking about that a couple days ago. But the, uh, you have d lots of choices on the market, but I think either one of those companies, Kessel or AI, would probably take good care of a mixed reef. It's just a matter of not using too much light and not running the light too long per day. Howard, that is a good question. It does make sense. I don't know the number. Uh, maybe someone in the chat can tell us how much citric acid to how much water to know how much to mix up. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if maybe you need to use one cup with like three gallons of water. I just don't know. But uh, that's, I, I think I'm going to be ordering some myself so I can try it and see what it does for, for my own eyes. I'd like to see what it's like. I don't know how to say that name, but the question is, if I were to add gold into a reef tank, what effect would it have you know, at all? Would there be any kind of negativity? Um, gold is essentially inert. I don't think it would have a negative effect. If you have, if you have that much gold, I want you to send me some. <laughs> I'll try it out of my tank. <laughs> no, um, I don't think it would cause any harm. I don't know anyone that's done it. Uh, I don't really want to recommend it today because, you know, we don't want trace metals in our aquarium. But I don't know if gold's even a trace metal. That's a heavy metal, right? Gold is heavy. I really should have paid more attention in science when I was in high school. But that is an interesting question. <laughs> Let's see. Dave says, will you be doing a Clear Sea review? What is your opinion on it? Oh, uh, yeah, actually, I am going to do a review on it, and uh, it works great. It's actually pretty seamless. It does its job, and I've got a roll that... I got the extra large roll for what I'm running now, and uh, actually, you can see it right there. <laughs> That's the extra large roll. I just got it. I, got, I still got to hook that up, <clears throat> but I'm going to swap out the, uh, the remainder of my old roll, get the new roll on there, let it start doing its job again. Uh, it was offline while I was traveling because uh, the roll was about to run out and I didn't want to pull down it all the way through the machine. So anyway, uh, no, I mean, it works fine. It's something I don't have to actually babysit. It just does its job. And so, yeah, there will be a video review about that one coming soon. Um, let me see how many gallons that is. <laughs> I gotta do some quick math here. <clears throat> because I am not a metric guy, so I'm gonna change that to... Okay, so 200 gallon tank. Nick was saying that he was looking at getting a NIO skimmer and thought that 220 might be good for his tank. I think that wouldn't be a good one. The 160 would probably be fine for the 200, but you can go with the 220 and be a little bit larger, especially when you're running multiple tanks to a single sump. Uh, I think that would be fine. Yeah, I think it's a good choice. By the way, I like your profile pic. <laughs> Um, all right, I want to kind of go through some of these questions a little quicker. I'm taking too long. 
A good way to get rid of hydroids, you're going to have to rip them off the rock. Uh, it's You almost have to take like a razor blade and cut right underneath, get a little bit of the coralline underneath and just get them off the rock and just eliminate them. Um, there are animals that may go in your tank and help to eat hydroids, but hydroids are not the tastiest things in the world. It's just easier to remove them. Uh, in the past, if you couldn't rip them out, you would coat them with something like caulk wasser paste and just like cover it with frosting to smother them with this acid base type situation where it would just really cook them. But scraping them off is your best bet. And I would start to, I would deal with it now before you have too many. Because once you have a billion of them, it's going to be a real big battle. Ruben says, how can I save a bleached anemone? When it bleaches, the question is, how did it bleach? Was it the, uh, was it in your care when it bleached? Or did you buy a bleached one and you're trying to rescue it from the fish store? Which, you know, I mean, we all get those feelings. We all feel bad for an animal. Well, I'll, I'll help it. The first thing a bleached anemone needs is food. And so I would feed it a small bit of food every couple of days, like the size of a lima bean, just a little bit of food. You Only enough food for the anemone to eat it and not poop it out. If you feed an anemone food and then it poops it back out, you're using too much food because all the anemone did was eat the outside surface and then the main meaty part in the middle is just blob and just breaks down in your tank and adds to the pollution. So instead you want to make sure you're giving a little bit of food every single day. You're gonna wanna put it somewhere where it gets some light but not getting blasted. You can't just suddenly recharge its symbiotic algae within itself. It's gonna take time to build its own algae within itself to get unbleached, you know, to return to its normal coloration again. But if you try to overfeed it, if you try to hit with a bunch of light, it's probably not gonna do well. It's going to take a long time, but it can recover. It definitely can. Patrick Little says, if you're going to set up a 40 breeder for anemones and LPS, what type of lighting would you use? 40 breeder, huh? The A360X by Kessel, the Radeon XR15, and uh, those are two I would probably look at, those two choices, because not only is that a good light that you completely can adjust for even such a small tank, when you finally upgrade later, you have a really good light that you can put on the new tank. So I, I would be looking to those two lights for my choice. And like I said, you can you can set the intensity level to where it's lower so you're not cooking your livestock. Hey, one of our metal halides turned on. <laughs> I was like, why does my reef look weird behind me? Hang on a second. Could have sworn I turned off. Oh, I didn't turn off that one. There we go. Better. Okay, much better. <laughs> <laughs> Xjet says something that we all should know. Why are six lines such jerks? Six line wrasses are actually pretty aggressive. Uh, that's why people like to buy the four line or the eight line. I don't know what the deal is with six, but six makes them mean and they can be you know territorial and just pick on other fish. I had one and he had you know he has these little spines on his back and they're standing up and uh, so I called him Spike. And, you know, he was fine. He was cute. But, uh, yeah, they can be a real pain. But why? I don't know, because they have six stripes, I guess. Hi, Taz. Let's see. John, I believe, is watching this stream on a fire stick. That's pretty cool. Oh, boy. Um, all right, this one here. <sighs> he wrote, Hey, Mark, it's been a while. My sump has been inactive for a year, and there was still water in the refuge area, the refugium. Do I have to replace the Miracle Mud if I want to start using the sump again? Man, just stagnant water sitting in a sump for a year? I would clean the entire thing out. Yes, I would start fresh. I wouldn't try to save any of that. Uh, I wouldn't save any of the mud or anything. I would just start fresh. And because why take the chance? You're trying to set up a new tank and you're going to be dealing with whatever issues are going on that old sump. That would be a problem. So no, I would drain it out and start fresh. Uh, 
Um, Joe says, I've been looking for new corals, but my local fish store has an issue with Aptasia in their frag tanks. If I was to buy any frags, is it possible to make sure I don't add Aptasia to my tank while adding a frag? Well, visual inspection, but I mean, Aptasia can be itty bitty tiny little slivers. I mean, it's possible one can sneak in. At the same time, I wouldn't ever avoid buying a coral because there was an Aptasia on it. You can actually just walk over to the sink and scrape the Aptasia off the coral and then put the coral in your tank and continue living. And if you happen to see one later, you can put something on whatever, you know, pops up and kill it again. You know, so I wouldn't... Now, if you had just... Let's say you had a bird's nest colony and it was filled with Aptasia, then I would probably toss the colony. You know, I'd save a few tips and start fresh and just throw away the rest because you can't get them all out. They're just, they're all embedded in there. So it comes down to that. But you know what? Every fish store is going to have some kind of pest in their tank. <clears throat> That's why we dip everything we get to eliminate those pests and to scrape off things that we don't like or even cut off the frag plug entirely and just save the coral itself and plant that in our reef with some putty. Lamont, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. And John did so as well. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Let's see. Brian says, have you used fluconazole? What's your experience? I'm on day three of using FluxRx, and the results are already looking very promising. I haven't personally used it. That is the one thing I haven't had an opportunity to use it. But I do sell the product in my shop because people need it. Um, fluconazole is a three-week treatment that will reduce hair algae, bryopsis, and it can even get rid of bubble algae. So it's pretty popular in that regard, but uh, it takes time. It's not something that will happen in a matter of two or three days. So while you're seeing, you know, hints of, ooh, that looks good, just remember it's going to take a few weeks to get this knocked out. But you should have a really good uh, cleaned up tank when you're done with this treatment. Hmm. Um, Druins, I believe is your name, says I'm going to be building a stand and drilling my nano reef to set up a sump. I've never done this before and I'm researching it thoroughly. Are there any tips that are not really voiced often? <clears throat> well, when you're drilling your tank, you gotta make sure that the tank uh, doesn't is, is not tempered glass. That's the first rule. Because if you're trying to drill through tempered glass, it'll just shatter. And Reef Dudes just did a video recently, like in the last four weeks, where they were drilling through a tank and they were almost completely through the glass and the whole black back glass just, just spider webbed with a million cracks. So that tank was tempered. <laughs> so you wanna make sure your tank isn't tempered. Um, you wanna silicone in an overflow box or you know, something to go around your plumbing and then you'll drain into your sump and uh, your, the whole sump conversation is a video in itself, but my website's filled with sump information. I have so many articles about sumps and what a sump is, what to include, what to incorporate, what to avoid, water depth, height, size of the sump. It's all covered in there. So I know you have a nano, <clears throat> so you don't have a lot of room to work with, but uh, I would start looking at just the articles I have on my website, and then you can go to the shop area of my site and look at some examples of sumps I build myself to kind of get some inspiration. And then um, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's the more you read, like you said, you're doing all this research, and the more you read and learn, the, the more prepared you'll be for this process. It's still going to be a little nerve-wracking as you're doing it, and it's going to be very nerve-wracking when you first start running it because you're going to keep thinking, is it going to overflow? Is the sump going to hold? You know, the, all these things go through your mind, especially in the middle of the night. That's totally normal. Don't freak out. And uh, just keep an eye on things, and uh, I think you'll be very happy with it. A lot of us love having a sump under our tank. Howard Bash is saying, uh, lanthanum chloride, you can buy brands of C-Clear, which I think is pure lanthanum chloride. C-Clear is the least expensive, but is the ratio of chemical to RO and drip? Yes, that is the question. What are you going to need to use? That's why I don't use C-Clear, and I just buy Phosphator X. Uh, honestly, yes, you can definitely use the stuff you buy at the pool house, and you can save money. But there is the element of risk that you're going to make a mistake, that you're going to mix it up improperly, that you're going to use too much, 
and uh, you need a recipe. Now, odds are someone on the internet has written a recipe of how to mix that stuff up exactly to give you what you need. Uh, I do know that Fosban L, which is Fosban Liquid by Two Little Fishies, is a more affordable choice than Phosphator X. Um, you get a 500 milliliter bottle. You have to mix it up with 1,000 milliliters of water, which gives you 1,500 milliliters of solution to work with. But uh, I found Phosphator X just to be easier. I can just take the bottle and squeeze it into the tank. And I use maybe two of those bottles a year. And that's just not expensive to me. I mean, I really don't think so. One bottle treats a thousand gallons, and if I treat my tank four times in a year, five times in a year, and I go through two bottles, you know, it just is what it is. What is that? Less than 50 bucks? So I kind of prefer it because it's super easy. I can unscrew the cap, and I can count the drops, and I can walk away, and I'm done. But if you want to use lanthanum chloride, you know, like a science experiment, you know, and you're, you're wanting to mix up your own solution, and you're wanting to drip it in at a certain rate, or use a dosing pump, or however you're going to do it, um, by all means, but it's, I mean, it really actually is the riskier way of doing it versus the way I've been recommending. So, you know, but don't let me stop you if, if you feel comfortable doing that. Lamont says, what do you feed your corals? Well, uh, I feed the fish frozen food from Rod's food every single week. Or I'm sorry, every single night. And so every night Rod's food goes into the system and the fish eat it and then the fish poop all over my corals and the corals eat the fish poop. But once or twice a week, I try to make it a point to mix up Bena Reef, which I then pour in the tank. And I just did a picture of that stuff on my Instagram that you can check out. It's a powder. You mix it with some water, you know, in a cup and stir it up and let it sit for five minutes. Then you just pour it in the tank and it feeds everything. And it's, it's so fine that the fish can't eat it because it, but it smells great because the fish go crazy for it, but they can't eat it because there's nothing solid to bite down on. Um, and it doesn't make your skimmer go crazy. And it doesn't grow cyano, and it doesn't grow algae, and it just it just works. And your glass stays clean longer, which is amazing to me. So that's why I really like that product. <clears throat> Michael says, do you have any larger starfish in my tank? Uh, the starfish I have are about this big, maybe this big. Um, there's two or three in there. There's a red one usually floating around the middle here. There should be a brown one in there somewhere. There might be a banded one still. I don't know. I haven't seen as many starfish in my reef as I did in the old days. But um, I had more in there, but they're always hiding. You just see an arm. I see the red one regularly. And then in my anemone cube, I see the brown one that I've had for uh, 16 years. So, But I don't have any linkias. I don't have any fromias. I don't have any biscuit starfish. You know, It'd be kind of fun to add some other things in there at some point. Zach says, how should you properly saturate Kalkwasser? Well, I believe, if I remember correctly, you're going to take a tablespoon per gallon of water, and you are also going to put in a splash of vinegar. <laughs> and when you mix that up, you should get a good solution of Kalkwasser, which will be a gallon of solution. And then the skin on the top doesn't go in your tank, and the sediment in the bottom of the container doesn't go in the tank. Just the fluid in between, that's what you want to dose into your tank. And ideally, dosing it at night while your uh, reef is asleep is good because it helps to bring the pH up during the late night hours. You want to be very careful with Kalkwasser. It's got a pH of 12, and you don't want it to, uh, to nuke your tank. So that's why I don't personally use it myself because of the risk factor, and it's messy. But if you don't mind doing all those things, um, there are a lot of people that have been using it for a very long time with good success. Salty Reef is asking, uh, or is saying, I just dosed Flatworm RX six hours ago. When should I do my water change? I was thinking of doing it tomorrow. You, sir, did not watch my video from two weeks ago where I warned you change the water 15 minutes after you add it to your tank. So please go watch that video right now. I don't know what we're talking about here. When you say gold nuggets, are we talking about gold flakes? Are we talking about fish? <laughs> like gold nugget clownfish with a black sand bed? I don't understand what you're trying to do. It, it sounds like you're getting too creative for your tank.
um, itch theoya stuff. <laughs> I'm sure I totally botched, butchered that, and I should know that word, right? Because it's about fish. Pretty sure that means fishy. Um, are you consider getting a scrubber from Clearwater Scrubbers? He offered to give you one for free. Um, I have been offered things from different companies, and I didn't say yes or no. I didn't. I don't think I even answered that email. I wasn't looking for one, and uh, I run a refugium, so <clears throat> I haven't gotten to the point where I even want to hook one up yet. But that was nice that he offered. Uh, let's see. <laughs> one person said, I wish I could find those orange glasses. Like, trust me, you don't want them. Uh... Brian says, what's the best way to vacuum your sand without sucking it all up at the same time? They have these gravel vacs. It's a big, long tube within a flexible tube on the end. And usually you will push down and it'll suck up like an inch of sand or two inches of sand. And then when you lift it off the sand, it like pours out. And you just kind of like stab it in and lift and stab it in and lift. And that way you don't suck all the sand out of your tank. And you don't suck it all up into that riser tube. And it is a process that does work. And uh, it can be beneficial. The problem is, is that... Normally, when somebody is vacuuming a sand bed, they have to keep vacuuming the sand bed. It just never stops. It becomes a regular routine. If you don't do it, the tank doesn't look right. If you keep doing it, you know, it looks good, but it's sort of like once you start, you have to keep doing it. So you have to decide if that's what you want to do. But yeah, it definitely works. The fish store by me, Frank's Tanks, that he's vacuuming a sand bed all the time. His tanks always look great. And he changes water three times a week in his tanks. I mean, it's, he does a lot of maintenance. White Ice says, what are your thoughts on marine pure blocks versus a refugium? Um, I tried out a type of marine block in my system for eight months, and it actually almost killed my refugium, and I didn't see the results I was hoping for. It didn't denitrify my water like I hoped. So I am back to using a refugium because I enjoy it. So that is kind of my point of view, that the blocks just didn't work out for me. <clears throat> um, Azari says, Xenia and clove polyps never made it in my tank. That's weird because Zoas and Acros are doing, uh, doing their best. Is it because the system is too low nutrient? Um, I think we use the word low nutrient uh, excessively these days because... What is low nutrient exactly? I mean, what's the actual definition of low nutrient? Are we really keeping these pristine systems where there's no nutrients whatsoever present? Every time you put food in the tank, you're adding nutrients. Uh, if you add any kind of additives, you're probably adding some nutrients too. The fact that Zinnia didn't do well could be a water parameter situation with some kind of change in alkalinity or salinity or temperature. Zinnia is very particular. When it's happy, it looks great. When it's unhappy, it just melts. Uh, I've never kept clove polyps intentionally. I, I tried to get some in the clove family, the daisy polyps, and they just weren't getting enough food. So it could be that in your case, uh, the cloves weren't getting enough food, uh, like direct target feeding possibly, and that might have done well, where the zoas and the acropora seem to be doing just fine. So is it possible? You know, It could even just be that those corals weren't compatible with the corals you already have. You have lots of zoas, you have lots of acros, they're all happy, you added this other thing and it didn't do well. Could be a toxicity issue in the tank, you know, the, you know, the chemical warfare I talked about earlier. Could be, you know, you were combining too many species into one ecosystem. Uh, it could be where they were sitting in the tank, how much light they were getting. I mean, there's a, f a lot of factors, it's kind of hard to answer that question. But, you know, if you really liked something like Zinnia and you want to try it again, try it again. And see if it does better this time. Maybe. It was just some weird circumstances that prevented it from going well, but the next time it is better. Uh, Will says, I just recently added a copper band butterfly, mainly for Aptasia removal, and I absolutely am falling in love with it. Such a curious little guy. Do you have any recommendations on food or care? Well, they definitely need to be fed, and if you're if they're only eating Aptasia like you're suggesting to get them under control, 
when they eat them all, what are they going to eat at that point? So you definitely want your copper band to be eating some kind of food that you put in the tank every single day so it has enough stores in its body that it can maintain and not starve to death in your tank. So I would just be concerned that there is the risk that it won't like any of the foods you're trying. Uh, when I bought my the copper band that's in this tank now, in the store it was eating adult brine shrimp, and so I bought all the brine shrimp they had <laughs> and took it home with me so I could feed it, feed it, feed it, feed it, feed it. And I kept mixing in other foods with the brine shrimp, and I was able to get the copper band onto frozen mysis, which has worked out great because I put in mysis. I've also used... If you can get black worms, you can put those in your tank. If you can't get black worms, you can get blood worms. Blood worms typically are frozen, though. Black worms tend to be live, and uh, copper bands will eat either of those as well. So you could try that. I used to put in one cube of blood worms every single day in my tank to make sure the copper band got food. And then one day I noticed she wasn't eating them. She was going for the mysis. I was like, okay, even better. And so I didn't have to buy blood worms anymore. <clears throat> Uh, Michael says, I just got my Mindstream monitor this past weekend. Do you still have yours running on your tank? Yes, I do. Let me see if I can find it. I've been looking at it on my computer rather than my phone, so... Mm -hmm. It's probably not going to know my password. It never knows my password. All right. There we go. All right. Logged in. Sorry, it took a minute. Nope. I uh, need to do it another way. Sorry. Hang on. Give me a second here. So I'm going to shrink this down here so I can share that with you. And I haven't done this in a while. So here is my, my app. And you can see that alkalinity is measuring it. Actually, I can do another thing here. Let me see. What can I do? Give me one second here to pull this other one up. Too many passwords. Alrighty. So now I'm going to try and do this. We'll do this. All right. <clears throat> We're just going to flip back and forth, I think. That's the easiest way. I was trying to do like two tabs at once, but I don't think I can pull that off because it only wants to show one window at a time. So here's my apex. <clears throat> Shows the temperature right now is at 77.6. The pH is 7.95. Then we go over here and it shows the pH is 7.99 and temperature is 77.4. So we are very close in, uh, in those temperature and pH. Alkalinity is measuring 8.48 on in uh, carbonate alkalinity and the trident is showing that my alkalinity is at 9.2, which is correct. The That's total alkalinity where the Mindstream is measuring carbonate alkalinity, so the number is supposed to be lower, so it's a little bit lower, and that's completely normal. Calcium is measuring at 409, and the apex says it's at 431, so those are very close. And then magnesium is at 1435, and the mine stream says I'm at 1317. And so those are the numbers that I've been kind of watching between both. It's showing lower magnesium on the mine stream, but I'm actually glad to see the lower number because I want to dose it. <laughs> <laughs> and since I planned to dose it, I wanted to make sure that uh, 
you know, I wasn't overdosing my tank. And I, you know, I just, I just, I'm losing Montipora because of a lack of magnesium. And so I feel like I need to get some into the tank, even though the Trident is telling me I have plenty. So <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know what else I can do here other than just accept that that just is what the Trident comes up with. But, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, the honest truth is I kind of have my doubts about that one number. I just don't think the magnesium is that high, but the only way to know is to test, test, test and verify. And, you know, I have a couple of test kits I can use and I can send off stuff for ICP as well. But in the end, I'm looking at the corals not doing well and I'm like, well, what is going on if it's not a lack of magnesium? So other than that, uh, temperature, uh, salinity is measuring at 36.1 in, in a uh, mine stream. And in... The apex it is measuring at 38.5, but that is still an uncalibrated probe that I have not corrected. So anyway, I don't know if that helped you at all or if it just caused more confusion, but uh, the fact is, is that we have some devices to track things versus taking out your test kits once a week. Like I always say, it's water test Saturday. So you have to get out your test kits and you check your pH and you check your alkaline and you check your calcium and then you don't test it for another week or longer. Some of you guys don't. You just kind of, eh, the tank looks fine. I'll do it later. And you put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off. And then when things start going wrong, then you start pulling out all your test kits. Uh, with devices like the Mindstream and the Trident, I'm getting much more, I, it actually makes me a little lazier. I'm more informed because I can just open up an app and look and just see where the numbers are right now, rather than having to get out the test kits and start measuring things by hand. So, <clears throat> yeah, mine is definitely still running. Hi, JS. Nice to see you on here. <laughs> Ellen says, <laughs> Oh, great guru of all things reef. I have a golden toadstool that has been with me for two years. I got it as a frag and has grown, into, grown in well, but never extends its uh, little polyps. Uh, it could be of a fish nipping at it. That was my situation. I had a powder blue tang that would just mow them down, and so the toadstool always looked smooth, and the polyps were not extended. And when that fish died, the coral looked way better. <laughs> so I would get back away from your tank, make the room dark, and watch the tank and see what fish is constantly interacting with that coral and see if you can figure out what's happening. Because that's probably what it is, is that something is nipping at that coral on a regular basis. In the back of my tank, I have a toadstool leather that's about this big around now. It's up, it's on the glass. And uh, the only time it closes down, I hit it with a cleaning magnet trying to clean the glass. And that coral's totally in my way. So, but I would think that, uh, I think you have something nipping at it, honestly. Let's see. You know what? Uh, that's a good point, Marcus. I could dose calcium to bring up my calcium level a little higher because I'm only around 400. And maybe, because I mean, basically the rule is magnesium is three times your calcium. And it's just mine has stayed really high. My magnesium has stayed high. My calcium is always around 400 or so. Like I said, it was 412 or something. So maybe if I brought it up to 425 or 450, that would make a, a slight change in the magnesium measurement. That would be nice. So I'll have to get my hands on some because I don't have any kind of core, uh, calcium additive on hand, <laughs> believe it or not. I have tons of calcium reactor media, but I don't have any calcium product. Nathan says, I have an RODI system with all new filters. It's only four months old, and I let it run for two minutes to avoid tedious creep. And then uh, when the number gets down to four, that's when I turn on the DI but the DI output is up to 14 for a couple of minutes. That shouldn't be the case. I wonder if maybe it's where the probe is located in the DI housing, that it's just not measuring uh, the correct water, for lack of a better term. Like, if the sensor before the DI is showing it's four, then the sensor on the outside should be four or less. <laughs> it shouldn't be 14. It shouldn't be 14 at all, because it's DI. And 
unless the entire cartridge is turned completely orange and it's just leaching out TDS, I don't think it should do that. That doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, the fact that it's only doing it for a couple minutes is good news because you can actually keep an eye on it and toss out a couple more minutes of water before you start collecting your good water. But uh, I don't know why it would do that initially. That doesn't make any sense because if it's coming in at four, it's got to come out at four at the very minimum. That's an odd one. Your unhappy face uh, went really well with that question. Mad Jeppy says, how many corals can you add at the same time? And when is the best time to add corals to a new tank? Well, I don't know what size tank you're talking about. I don't know how old the new tank is. Uh, usually it's best to try out a couple of corals and see how they do before you add more, rather than adding a whole bunch and then watching everything die at the same time. So I would suggest getting a few testers and see how they do. If they do well, you could get a few more frags. But again, how much tank size do you have to work with? How much water volume do you have to work with? How much can your protein skimmer put up with as you're planting corals? Because as you putty things down, the more and more putty you use in a single session, the more of the, the glue's resin is going into the water, and it can affect your protein skimmer and make it overflow. It can uh, make the water a little cloudy and hazy. So, you know, I... I can't really give you a solid number. <laughs> like, a hundred! You know, I mean, I can't do that. Uh, I would just keep it reasonable. Something you can do within 15 minutes or so. And you can always add a little bit more each week and let it really fill up nicely over time because it is a hobby. And that way you can just uh, kind of build something really nice over time rather than trying to do the insta-tank. Seska's Reef says, are there any predators you would recommend for Mahano anemones in the SPS Reef? Your hands. Uh, really, it's going to be you rather than some kind of a, a fish or a, uh, an animal that's going to go after them because they're Mahanos. And uh, you definitely want to get rid of them before they get out of control. So you're going to have to get your arm wet and you're going to have to scrape them away. Reef Real Estate in Canada says, does anyone know if you can use the Trident with the Apex Classic? And the answer is no, it doesn't work. You have to have the new Apex. Steven says, I have a question about breeding a pair of clownfish. I have thousands of babies. How do you get them to grow on what food? Uh, it's not like freshwater. Clownfish babies have to be in their, uh, their own protected environment without the parents, no light, and they got to be fed rotifers and then slightly larger foods over time. It takes weeks to turn them into viable little fish. And it's not something you do in your tank, and you're going to have to do a lot of research. So I would suggest maybe going to MBI, which is Marine Breeders Initiative, and look at their articles on, on fish breeding and find out what you can learn about how to raise clownfish, because there's a lot of people out there that do it. But it's not something you can do in your tank. Let's see. Mosh is asking me about the calcium reactor video. I know, still not done. <clears throat> I should never tell you guys what I'm going to be working on someday because then I don't do it and you get mad at me. <laughs> I, uh, there's only so many hours in the day. My, I've complained to you about my back. It's still a nightmare. Um, I started physical therapy this last week. I've already been twice. I go again for the next couple of weeks. And then I go see my surgeon again. And then we do surgery in December to fix what's wrong in my neck. And uh, I feel like I'm maybe working four hours a day <laughs> rather than eight or nine or 10 hours because of the back pain. And it's really bad and I just do the best I can with it. I take pills, I use ice packs, I try hot compresses, uh, I do exercises, uh, I'm doing the physical therapy. I mean, I'm doing all this stuff trying to just get by for now and just counting down the days till I can get fixed. And uh, it just I just can't sit at the computer and edit. I, I have the desire. I want to do it. 
and then it's like I feel like crap I'm not doing it and uh, that's just it's been really bad the last couple of months I you guys saw me on one of these streams where I looked horrible and uh, right now I'm doing a little bit better but I feel run down I just uh, I think it's pain but uh, you know I just whenever I can sit and edit I mean I'd love to crank out all the videos I could and just load you guys up it would make me super happy to get them off my hard drive and I mean I scroll through my phone and I see old videos that never got used <laughs> it's just amazing how much content is on my phone I feel like if I just plugged in my phone into YouTube and said just download it all you guys would have you know whatever that is 512 gigs of entertainment that would keep you busy for the next few years but uh, no I really do like to sit down and edit things properly and, and do them right and like even these live streams I'm standing because it's easier on my back than it is to sit so but there's times where no matter what position I'm in whether I'm lying down standing sitting it doesn't it just hurts like crazy and I just have to deal with it so um, whatever's going on with me I mean I, I can't explain it I just know there's something wrong in there uh, there's some kind of growth in my spinal cord, you know, off the bones, off the the, the discs, and uh, I mean, you know, I even as I look in the camera, I can see that my face is rounder. Um, I have gained so much weight over the last year; it's ridiculous. I mean, I'm up like over 30 pounds from where I was, and I see videos a year ago. I'm like, wow, what a difference! And I'm, I'm really kind of a uh, well, I'm super annoyed at that. That's not your problem. That's my problem. But uh, I don't like that. I just I want to go back to my normal self, and I'm. I think that getting rid of the pain and getting back to my normal routine will help me immensely and kind of getting this under control. But I think there's going to be a lot of work at the gym too to kind of get back on track. I've never had my body just go bonkers like this, like it has for the last few months. Um. Hello, Tolga. Let's see. <sighs> Jeremy says, my four-month-old 75-gallon uh, tank with a 10-gallon sump. Wow, that's magical. Uh, there's dead rock and bio pellets. I accidentally bottomed out my PO4 with GFO two months ago. Now I dose PO4, and my tank seems to consume 0.1 ppm daily. Nitrates around 40. Tips. Well, actually, I mean, you know, you're telling me all these numbers, but you're not telling me how the, the livestock is doing. If the tank is doing, I mean, it's a four-month-old tank. I don't know what all you've accomplished in there. But obviously, you want to keep some phosphate and some nitrate. That's important. Having zero, zero doesn't work, as more and more people are realizing. And uh, not having a lot of algae in the tank uh, means you're doing a good job. But if you are dealing with a lot of algae, I mean, it's a four-month-old tank, though. And young tanks go through those algae phases. So... Don't know if your tank needs any help right now. I mean, from your, your question, I don't see a, a complaint or, or a concern other than your nitrates are up a little bit. Uh, it's a 75 gallon tank. If you did a 40 gallon water change, your nitrates would be 20 in one water change. Uh, George, you're going to have to talk with Triton then and see what they recommend for removing aluminum from the water. Um, just make sure that number is accurate. Because I feel like there was an element that a lot of the U.S. customers were getting a report on that doesn't happen in Europe. And it turns out it was just, uh, I mean, how do I say this? <laughs> um, it wasn't a parameter out of whack. But it was because... I don't remember the exact details, but it was just that every single test that came from the U.S. had this really high number across the nation, and that wasn't possible. And that's when they realized it was something to, you know, their configuration wasn't correct on their end. But I would talk with them and see if they have a suggestion on how to lower the aluminum level. Where would you be getting aluminum from? You know, what would be, what would be adding it to your water? Uh, and also, just so you know, if you have any leather corals in your tank and they're doing well, then your aluminum level is not bad because they hate aluminum and it'll shut a coral down. Ah, that reminds me, you know, we were talking about the toaster leather wouldn't open. Yeah, you might want to see if there's aluminum in your tank. <laughs> 
There was a product by Kent called Nitrate Sponge, and it was aluminum based. And you would use it to absorb nitrate, but it just shut down the leather coral. So I, I forgot about that till just now. <laughs> James asks a question, what parameter swings are anemones particularly sensitive to, or is it just any kind of swing? I would say temperature is a big one. So we like to keep things very, very stable. You know, you just want to maintain proper reef parameters. And if you do that, they're just going to thrive. I mean, this sea bay has been this anemone now for four years. And, uh, you know, it just pretty much stays in that spot. There was a little bit of wandering, but for the most part, it stayed where it belongs. And I keep the tank as stable as I can, temperature-wise, and my regular water parameters of alkaline, calcium, magnesium, uh, salinity, temperature. Those are the ones, the big five for me. And uh, it just, they just take care of themselves. Are you seeing anything specifically with yours where they're not doing well? Or is there something that brought, prompted the question? Or are you just trying to learn more before you get one? I would have to know that, James. Sammy is saying, what should I put a puffer fish in? Well, it would need to go in an aquarium. <laughs> I can't tell if you're trolling me here yet. But... Uh, they need a large tank, they need to be fed, they're messy eaters, they pollute the water. It really belongs in a predator tank, not in a reef tank. Let's see. Glenn says, uh, what was the 2019 best moment for you so far this year involving the reef scene? And what was your best accomplishment or change to your home reefs that you're very happy with? Hmm. Well, <sighs> this has been a good year and uh, a lot of cool things have happened. I have a big trip coming up uh, the end of November, right over Thanksgiving. And that might end up being my best... <laughs> moment of the year. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But I, I love what I do. And, you know, I, I might complain about hurting or whatever, but I, I get to run a business essentially out of my home. And I take care of people across the nation and even internationally. I meet with you guys almost on a weekly basis here on YouTube to chat with you about your tanks and what's going on with mine. And I really enjoy all of that interaction. It's, it's really nice. It, in the old days, you know, we wrote on forums and, you know, we'd stay up all night on computers just typing back and forth to each other. And it wasn't a chat, it was just build threads. And they were, you know, you would post something, some cool update, and then 50 people would reply and they'd subscribe to it. And it was quite the process. And those forums still exist to this day, but I don't think they're as dominant as they used to be. I think that the whole hanging out with you guys on YouTube and then meeting with you at different shows across the nation and, and you know, you telling me you know, something that helped your tank or you know, how... You know, I mean, I, I love the compliments. They're always nice. But I'm also really happy when I know that what I suggested helped because that was the whole point. You know, I'm trying to give you some of my experience so that way you can avoid some of the common pitfalls and have success. So, yeah, the biggest moment or the best moment of the year might be that one. I don't know. There's a couple things that have happened this year. But I don't have a specific one for you. That was a great question. I, I really love that. And accomplishment on my reef tank, mm, it's just, it's doing good. It's not leaking. <laughs> I mean, that's an accomplishment in itself. It's still holding water. You know, I got the new sump installed a few months ago. That was really exciting to me after having the same sump under there for nine years. I know the math will make sense to some of you guys that don't follow me closely, but that sump was built in 2010, 2011, and... Uh, this tank is only going to be six years old, but it was under a previous version of this tank that had sprung a leak. And I kept that sump going nonstop for nine years, and it finally got replaced. So it was really nice to do that. <clears throat> ah, someone's here from France. Hello, France. Let's see.
Hmm. Uh, ATF says, how many small gobies can you get for a Fluval Evo 5-gallon? And how much of water change is too much in a Pico or a nano tank that generally runs stable? All right, um, the tank is 5 gallons. <clears throat> gobies are tiny. You could probably have quite a few. You could go crazy and have like 15 little guys in there. It'd probably be fun. Um, maybe less because of feeding and water quality. And then water changes, as long as your temperature and your pH and your salinity match, you can pretty much change as much as you want. And, but you know, it's a small tank. So changing a gallon on a five gallon is a 20% water change. <laughs> it's a pretty significant water change. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a big thing. And like I was talking about my friend's reef bowl, I think that's a six gallon vase. She's having it change like, I think it said 120 milliliters once a week um, for an automatic water change system. So uh, smaller amounts of water changes probably be better for stability. The tiny tanks, the big challenge is top off and temperature because as a little bit of water evaporates, it just changes the parameter so quickly in that small tank. So you want to make sure it has a top-off system or you're adding water twice a day manually so it, it's maintained the same water line. You know, if your water line is right here, you want it to stay right there all the time. You don't want it to come down and you have to refill water up to here again. And then temperature is so important on small tanks. They can get hot or they can get cold. And it's hard to fit equipment in such a small tank to keep it the right temperature. So, you know, there's space constraints. You might have to float a frozen 20 ounce bottle in the tank on a summer day or uh, you're gonna use cooling fans to blow on it but then in the winter you want to make sure it doesn't get too cold so there's some challenges that's the big challenge for me with the pico tanks and the nanos is temperature and salinity if you can get those two locked in everything else kind of takes care of itself if you're pretty good at what you do all right Um, Mad River Reefs might be commenting on my discussion of Kalkwasser. I said a tablespoon per gallon. Um, I don't mean a tablespoon per gallon of the tank. I mean a tablespoon into a gallon of RODI water to make a gallon of Kalkwasser solution. Um, I, I just want to clarify that in case <clears throat> that came across wrong. Oops. <laughs> Let's see. Frank's Tanks uh, asks, what's the oldest fish in your tank right now? And uh, how long have you been in this hobby? <clears throat> so the oldest fish is Spock. That's this Nassau right here. Her and the Purple Tang were both acquired in 2004. So I've had them for uh, 15 years, going on 16. And I've been telling everyone I got in the hobby in 98. Turns out I was wrong. I got in the hobby in 97. So um, it's been even longer than I thought, 22 years. And uh, it's been a good run. Now, the Skunk Clownfish... They're not as old, but I got them about four years ago, and I bought 11 of them and put them in the tank, and I just did a head count a couple days ago, and there's still 11, so that was pretty cool, because they're hard to measure the or to count because they're not staying in one little ball. They're scattering themselves through this end of the tank. In case you see a couple over here on the other end. Uh, but in the, for the most part, they're staying near the anemone and the Duncan corals. That's kind of their thing, and they, they squabble, but they seem to still make it work, and that's been nice. Trying to think what else is old in my tank. I mean, I've got old corals too. <laughs> I've got a Blue Ridge coral in the back of my tank. I mentioned it last live stream that I got in 2003. And I've got that brown starfish in the anemone cube that was also from 2003. Alrighty. Hey, Casey Reefs. Uh, the Siki pumps are good pumps. They're well known. They're used in a lot of products. Made in Italy. Have a good reputation. Um, 
I don't have any person on anything I own, but uh, definitely well aware of them. White Ice says, when do you recommend to get a clam? Well, if you've got a reef tank and it's doing well, and uh, everything just seems to be stable, then you probably could get a clam. And you could look at the, there's different types, there's like four or five different species that we can purchase. And you want to find one that you like the look of and that can fit in your tank. And normally it's best, and I'll tell you this, this is kind of a trick you can use. If you're at the fish store and you're buying a clam, you can ask them if they have an empty clam shell from a clam that died, you know, just one side. And you can put the clam shell on your sand bed and then set the clam in it and it will hold onto the shell. And that way, if you need to move it anywhere in your tank, you move it with its base, its cradle. And it's a great way to kind of protect the bottom of the clam from anything in the sand bed coming up and attacking the clam from below. Let's see. Um, Reef Real Estate says, I have an amazing black ring tang, tail tang, an amazing black ring tail tang. He's had a cloudy right eye that cleared up after about two weeks, but it's back again. He's eating and doing everything normal. It could be that he's scratching his eye on a rock. They, they can actually nick themselves and they can heal. Spock has a, a cloudy eye, unfortunately, and I would love to have some vet polish it and make it clear again. I feel bad. But uh, I think she nicked it on a rock, and it's just steadily gotten worse over the years. But her other eye looks completely normal. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's the only thing I can think of, is that something is, it's actually scratching its own eye accidentally, and that's why it gets cloudy like that. The fact that it healed and got it again, it's kind of unfortunate. Uh, maybe you get lucky and it'll heal again. Uh, no, I don't mind that at all, Mad River Reefs. When people are asking questions and you guys are chatting, I, I'm just trying to look through all the conversations and get to the questions. <laughs> You're doing them just fine. Uh, Trevor says, did you get around to your experiments? No, I haven't done that yet. Um, but I was talking about that earlier in the stream because Sanjay did that with his tank and discovered that his CO2 rose. His oxygen didn't move, but his CO2 rose. But I haven't done that yet. Trent says, have you ever accepted a coral from a viewer? Wonder because I'd like to see one of mine in your tank. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have and I can. And it just you have to let me know what you've got in mind. So just let me know. It's actually kind of neat. A lot of the corals in my tank all came from certain people. And I can say this came from Dwayne. This came from Ryan. This came from uh, Cherry Corals. This one came from, I mean, it's pretty diverse. Uh, I don't always remember, but I try to keep track of different names of who's attached to what coral. I feel like I'm running out of steam, guys. I'm going to have to wrap this up. Um, oh, we've been going almost two hours, huh? 238 people are in here right now? I'm amazed. I didn't even have a topic today. <laughs> Maybe that's the trick. Don't have a topic. <laughs> Hey, Jay, I appreciate you coming to these live streams, you know. Let's see. Matthew says, I just purchased a dosing pump. What is the best way to set it up? The best times to dose, and once I do a water change, should I be testing parameters and dosing extra? Well, that's a lot. Okay, so first thing you want to do with your new dosing pump is read the manual. <laughs> it's so important that you read the manual. Learn exactly how to use it how it operates, how you calibrate it, and then get it you know, set up correctly. Uh, you can even test it with just RO water at first to make sure everything's working right before you even put any kind of chemicals in it. That way you don't run the risk of accidentally overdosing something as you're learning how to use the machine. But now that you've got the machine operating correctly, you know the manual, you understand the alerts, you've got it all set up properly, then you said, when should I dose? You want to dose alkalinity in the morning and you want to dose calcium in the evening, 12 hours apart. And they're going to 
the, the reason being is that alkalinity and especially pH is lower in the morning before the lights come on. So by dosing alkalinity in those early morning hours, you're actually buffering up the tank a little bit before the lights come on. And then the reason we don't dose calcium at the exact same time is because the interaction of the two chemicals in the water can just turn into a snowstorm in your sump or in your display tank. And you just, you're, it's just turning it into a solid instead of becoming liquid and, div and uh, dispersed into the system. So I recommend always dosing alkaline in the morning. And you can dose multiple times a day if you prefer. So you could do it from like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., four doses. And then you could do your carbon, your carbon, your calcium dosing 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m., you know, something like that. Um, that would be totally fine. If you're also dosing magnesium, it doesn't really matter what time of day for that one. Um, those are kind of the big three we dose. If there's something else you have in mind, uh, like no pox, uh, when I was dosing that, I set mine up to dose four times a day, so I did it every six hours instead of doing one big dose. So those are kind of some of my thoughts. I hope that helps. Uh, Max C says, what are your thoughts on feeding live phytoplankton to a reef tank? Oh, it's totally a good thing to do. Um, I Because my tank is so big, I would have to get like Phytofeast from Reef Nutrition because it's very condensed and I can just put in a squirt. <laughs> uh, but the benefit of phytoplankton in the tank is that you can feed your pods. And the more food in the tank, the more pods you'll have. And uh, pods are a food source for the fish. So, for example, if you had a mandarin and it likes to eat pods, by growing more pods in the system, the mandarin has more access to more food in the reef itself as it uh, forages looking for meals. Uh, it can help keep the glass clean longer too. It's interesting, it has that side effect. Uh, the only thing is about with dosing phytoplankton, it's usually best to turn off your protein skimmer for at least an hour because the skimmer will take the phytoplankton right out of the water. And uh, when there was a skimmate study done you know, a decade ago where they actually took skimmate from a bunch of hobbyists across the nation and they, I don't know what they did, they boiled it down to its essence and they determined what everything was and part of what all the, most of these skimmers had was phytoplankton in it too. So they've proven that it pulled it out. And then I also know that phytoplankton can be ingested by some corals, but there was another study done and they did a biopsy of an Acropora and they opened it up and found within its, let's call it the stomach, I'm sure I'm using the wrong term, they found phytoplankton inside the stomach of the coral, but it was the perfect bead of phytoplankton, so the coral could not break it down and get the phyto out. The shell was too hard. So that was an interesting uh, little nugget of truth that I never forgot. So certain foods in the tank can't be absorbed by everything. You can't just say, oh, phytoplankton takes care of everything. Certain things will not be able to absorb it or use it or utilize it. It's sort of like, I know this is gross, it's like eating corn. I'm going to just stop right there. If you know what I'm talking about, you already know where I'm going. <laughs> uh, Joanne, I'm not sure if that's a question or if, you're, or if it's an announcement. You know, like I'm getting my leopard rest to eat flake food because he eats frozen. Um, you can actually, if you're saying you're trying to switch from one to the other, you can combine the foods together at the same time and maybe the fish will learn that there's more than one choice. And that could be one way to kind of get them to transition from one thing to the other. But having it like a certain food, there's nothing wrong with that. At least you know you can provide a food that it eats and you don't have to worry about starving to death in your tank. Uh-oh. I don't see the previous post. Wait. Oh, just saw the post. Reef King, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, your heater stuck on and it cooked all the SPS corals in your tank. Let's uh, just kind of review that really quick. Um, when it comes to heaters in reef aquariums, I recommend three watts per gallon. So whatever size tank you have, if it's a 100 gallon tank, you need 300 watts of power. And then I recommend you divide that across two heaters. So instead of one 300 watt heater, I want you to get two 150 watt heaters. And then I'd like you to plug those into a controller. 
so that way when the tank temperature is correct it kills the power to the heaters rather than relying on the heater to turn itself off. Now in the case of Reef King his heater stuck on and it cooked the tank and it killed his corals. If it was divided across two heaters even if one stayed on it wouldn't have enough wattage to overheat the tank. It would just run and cost you a lot of money in electricity because it's running nonstop. But you might even notice that light never turns off. You're like, hey, what's wrong with this heater? But it's not, it doesn't have the wattage to do the damage. That's why I recommend dividing it. With my own reef, I actually divided across three heaters rather than two heaters, again, to limit my, my risk factor. And they were plugged into the apex, and the apex keeps track of the tank temperature and when the tank temperature is, reaches the ideal, it kills the power to the heaters so they can't even try to keep running. So that's, that's a hard one, man. I'm really sorry to hear that happened to your tank. Yeah, he said he lost 400 pounds of SPS. Whew. That's awful. Let's see. Alrighty. Uh, actually, that's a, a valid question. It was one of the things I asked my doctor specifically. I said, you know, would it be possible that I could uh, eat different foods and reduce the inflammation? And I mean, there's nothing invalid about that. That's 100% true. My problem is I have mechanical issues in my neck that have to be addressed. Um, I showed a picture probably a, a week ago or something like that, and it, it's there's just bad things happening inside there and it needs to be carved out and and opened up and cleaned out and give me some relief. So while I could change a diet or something, I could do other, you know, I could do physical therapy for the next 10 years of my life and I could, you know, improve how my muscles are operating around my neck. The problem is the mechanical within inside has to be fixed as well. And he, uh, the same surgeon that did my neck four years ago and solved a lot of my migraines, I'm having the same man work the same magic higher up. Um, I kind of wish he had done it all at once in the first place, but at the time he just did the one. Uh, that one is still doing a great job. It's a mechanical or a bionic disc is what he called it that is like an Oreo cookie inside my neck where one of my um, discs was. And so it's done well, but the ones above it, the two above it, they're in really bad shape. And so he wants to put in two more, you know, one and then one more. And I'm like, let's do it. Matter of fact, use double stuff. I'm fine with that. <laughs> let's make me taller. I, I love it. But, uh, you know, it's going to take some time to heal. Let's see. Uh, Trent, I have seen the suction cup therapy, believe it or not. I saw it during the Olympics. Looked crazy. Um, but no, I've not done that myself. There's, there's a lot of things out there that we all try, trying to find some relief. I just, you know, I've done the MRIs, I've done the CAT scans, you know, I've met with everybody, and, you know, it's just time to go in and fix it. And then hopefully I'll be great, and I won't be complaining about this ever again, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? Let's see. Um, Mad River Reefs is commenting before about aluminum in the water. Could it be coming from Miracle Mud? Yeah, it could. I mean, it's possible. <laughs> Jay says, whenever my leather doesn't open, I know it's time to change the carbon. That's great. Ace asks, Trident or Mindstream? My answer is both, which I know is twice as expensive. But the benefit is, is that uh, you have multiple things happening on your tank. The Trident will control things. The Mindstream is measuring things. So that's the difference. The Mindstream is uh, measuring a lot of different parameters. The Trident is measuring three. But for reef keepers, the three are the very important ones is alkaline, calcium, and magnesium. And so having a system set up that measures and you can even set up the controller to dose or not dose products based on those numbers is awesome. I mean, it's phenomenal. I've been using a code 
um, uh, virtual outlet inside my Apex that limits how much my calcium reactor runs to keep my alkalinity very stable. Uh, let me see if I can open that up for you guys really quick. We'll move this down here. All right, so we were on here before, and this is the Trident. And see, it shows it at 9.2. And the graph looks crazy, okay? I mean, let, I get that. And I just try to ignore the graph. I care about the numbers. So down here at the bottom, let's make sure you guys can see this. And let me get rid of this chat box. Down here at the bottom, it shows my minimum over the last week was 8.9, and my high for the week was 9.2. So we're talking about a swing of 0.3 alkalinity. I mean, essentially, this line should look more straight, in my opinion, but that's just a graph. And graphs, you know, they can be misleading just how they're drawn. But to have my alkalinity staying basically 8.9, or what we call 9.0, to 9.3, I mean, it's such a small margin. I'm very happy with that. And this has been going like this for weeks. Let me see if I can slide this back a little bit more. So it's loading. And here was 8.98 to 9.33. So it's been working really, really well in maintaining this. And here's 8.95 to 9.33. So it's about the same thing. All right, and then I'll show you guys on my website really quick. In case you are trying, oh, not that. <laughs> no, don't look, don't look. <laughs> Let's go here. Um, blogs. My computer was on autopilot there for a second. Uh, this article right here is how I use the Trident to control the calcium reactor. And so you guys can read through that. And you can see the code right here. There are screenshots to explain it, everything step by step in case you want to mimic it. If you own a Trident already and a calcium reactor, this would help you. So that article is right there on my blog page. It's actually the latest blog, which unfortunately was in September. It's time for an October blog. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that was funny. Alrighty. Uh, someone asked about vermited snails. Do I need to worry about them? Yes, Dustin, you do need to worry about them. Uh, don't let them get out of control. I have a couple of my tanks, so I don't care. But there are, there's a person uh, in Florida who's a friend of mine who said his tank is just filled with them, and he's ready to rip out all the rock and put new rock. So you don't want to get to that point. A few people have also, uh, several people recently have said bumblebee snails are great at eating vermitids. So you can do that. The other choice is to break off the tubes, glue the hole shut, and the worm will just die within the, under the glue. So, but I wouldn't just ignore it. No, I would, but you should not ignore it, is what I'm trying to say. If, uh, if I had millions, I'd, I'd have a whole other speech. But I've always had just a couple here and there. I saw one uh, way over here uh, two nights ago. I was like, oh, look. But that still didn't get me to get my arm wet. <laughs> so I do need to tackle it, but I haven't yet. Let's see. Trevor says, what are your thoughts on using mollies as part of the cleanup crew in a frag tank? Uh, it's been done. It can be done. I've never done it myself. I think it's kind of neat. Um, it's kind of weird to have a freshwater fish in a saltwater tank, but they are a brackish fish. They can handle it. Um, yeah, if you want to do it, why not? Let's see. Okay, uh, Varmer says, what's the most important advice you can give someone who's only experienced with keeping freshwater systems prior to setting up a saltwater tank for the first time? On my website that I was telling you about before, right on the front page, it says, new to saltwater, click here. So I want you to start there. And when you click that, it's gonna take you to a series of articles that are all there to help you be successful. So there's going to be some product reviews. Wait, I think I misclicked that. Hang on a second. There we go. No, it's still doing it. That's so weird. I will double check that. But uh, there is a newbies category in the articles. And these are all different articles. Like here's one about 
how does the substrate or the sand in your tank look? Here's I want to set up a saltwater tank. Here's new to the hobby. This is the basics. And this is the kind of thing you want to read over to understand just the basics over a cup of coffee. And this article is there to help you. And the reason I have written articles, because <laughs> I know this is a world full of YouTube people, is that to absorb all the information in a video, it's easy to forget stuff or to, or to get distracted. And so to have an article you can just open up and you can read why should I use RODI water and just take in the, the knowledge of what it does and how it can help you and how it can help your tank, you want to do that. So that's why I have these articles on here. Um, but the new to saltwater, and I want to set up a saltwater tank, this, this one right here is like a monster article. And this article has all these links to other articles as you're going through it. So you just work your way through it step by step, make it a bookmark, come back and read more later, watch a video later, you know, just work your way through it. It's super intense, but it's got a lot of information about the things I talk about on this channel, all organized into an area for someone that is new to saltwater. So I hope that that helps. Uh, I would, bottom line is, read as much as you possibly can, learn as much as you can before you spend any money at all. That's always what I recommend to people. That way we avoid killing stuff and we avoid having to buy things twice. All right. Claudius uh, just recently lost a couple of fish and I'm sorry to hear that. I am not a fish disease person. I cannot give you any advice. I apologize. And you guys have blown up this chat today. Um, Kyle says, at what point do you think one should switch from Kalkwasser in the ATO, in the auto top off, to physically dosing? Currently I'm using four teaspoons in a five gallon RODI container. Well, if what you're doing is working and it's maintaining, you don't have to change. Uh, I know people that literally all they do is top off with Kalkwasser and don't add anything else and somehow they make it work. Um, I'm sure water changes are involved too to replace some lost elements. The only downside of using as top off, top off is because when the evaporation rate drops and your tank's not evaporating as much, you're not going to be adding as much Kalkwasser back into the tank. So you might see some diminished returns until... Uh, the tank really starts evaporating a lot of water and then you're adding a lot of caulk washer and it might spike things too high. So you're going to have to keep an eye on that, make sure that it doesn't get out of control. But if, uh, if you find that it's working, you don't have to change it. But if you feel like you want to go a different direction, you want to go to dosing, then you can put caulk washer in your, your rear view mirror and never look back. And it'll be one less thing to do. I think I'm just going to wrap this up. I, I'm trying not to ignore any questions. Haley, very, thank you very much for the comment. <clears throat> I'm glad you've been enjoying it. I know it was a very diverse conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't see any more questions. I'm just going to wrap it up here. So... Um, it is Saturday. Please test your water in your tank. Measure everything. Uh, be sure you post your results. We uh, have a great group on Facebook, and you are welcome to join. We've got you know uh, over 5,500 people in the group now, and people are posting pictures of their tanks. It's not a selling group. You're not going to get bombarded with stuff to buy. And uh, we just help each other. We answer questions. We share pictures of things we love, and we are. A, it's kind of like a support group for nice people. 
So if you're a nice person, you want to join us, please do come. It's real easy to find. It's facebook.com slash groups slash me loves reef. Also, you definitely want to follow my business page on Facebook. And this one here, let's see if I can move this. Um, that is the page I post at least one thing to every single day. So you, you definitely want to follow that page if you haven't yet. And it's, it's not, it's going to be whatever I found on the web. It's not like me pushing stuff to sell all the time. However, I do need to end on one more graphic here for you. This one. Thank you very much for buying things from our website. You're helping me pay for whatever it is I got to pay, whether it's doctors or buying fish food for Spock or uh, uh, new equipment for the stream or whatever it is I do. You know, anytime you guys place an order, it always makes me happy. I, I do my best to fill them. I've been working as quick as I can with, you know, the limits of what's going on in my neck right now. But I, I think this last week I still managed to get 20 orders out the door. I was really happy about that. So if you uh, need something for your aquarium, please buy it from yellowsreef.com. You're helping support this channel and you're keeping me uh, fat. <laughs> I hope you guys have a great weekend, and there will be another live stream next week. And I, uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always available on social media. Guys, have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you later.